and all that kind of stuff. Like, like everybody, this, the Super Bowl has lots of fans. Football has lots of fans, right? Well, Jesus Christ has lots of fans too, amen? Yeah. Folks who want to show up and see what's going on. Folks who want to critique and analyze and cheer. Folks when the dust settles haven't broken a sweat because uh, while we're watching the game today and they're on our couch and, and I want to see them make a certain play, I want to see them. I'm like, oh, they could have got that touchdown. The fact that it matters, I'm not on the field playing. Like, what do I know? I'm on just an armchair quarterback, right? And sometimes, sometimes we're like that with the church. It's so easy sometimes to tell everybody what to do from the outside versus actually having skin in the game and actually playing the game. But sometimes I think we have to ask ourselves, are we simply fans of Jesus? Are we functioning, functioning members of his church and Jesus' team? Are you in Team Jesus this morning? Are you playing for Jesus? Jesus, we're in the Beatitudes. We're going to look at the second half of them today. And Jesus says, man, you know what? If you're in the game, if you're in the kingdom this morning, this is what it looks like to have relationships in the kingdom. Last week we talked about our relationship with God in the kingdom and what God expected. This week we're going to talk about what it's like to have relationships with people like Mayama and so on in the kingdom and what it's like to be kingdom citizens. So turn with me in Matthew chapter 5 this morning, verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain, and then he sat down, and his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus is kind of laying down what it's like to live in a kingdom. And I love the fact that while he's got a crowd of people around him, as we talked about last week, he calls his disciples close because he wants us followers to kind of get what he's saying, to see how important this is. The Beatitudes show us who we are becoming in Christ. They show us who we are becoming in Christ. Not that we've all arrived, but if you're walking with Jesus, these things that Jesus is laying out, this is who you become. That's good news. That means who I am today it's not who I'm going to be tomorrow. That if I, if I didn't have such a great day today, I could have a better day tomorrow, a better day after that. Because God has begun to work in me. He's begun to work in you. He's going to bring it to completion. So what it means is just be faithful. It's kind of like we've been reading our Bible since the beginning of January. You know, some of you said the first couple of weeks was kind of challenging. Like, you're not sure what to journal. But now on Wednesday night, most of you are doing it. And we had an awesome time this Wednesday. The men got down a little bit early. We headed downstairs. And the ladies were wrapping up, and we got to pray over the ladies. Well, it turned into anointing some people and praying with some people, and everybody was hungry and thirsty for Jesus this week. And that was awesome. That was awesome. That's what we're becoming as Christ followers. So last week, we started this journey on the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus' opening words on kingdom living, where Jesus said, you know, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And poor in spirit just means, like, before God, we are just totally honest about who we are and our relationship with him. I just said, God, this is me, that's it. Take it or leave it. Luckily, he loves each and every one of us. He takes us as we are. We said, blessed are the meek, right? We talked about meekness. We talked about humility. You know, we, we talked about the first four of these Beatitudes last week where we just said, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so what Jesus is saying is, you know, blessed are you who, who, who when you look at the world and everything the world has to offer, you hunger and thirst for a relationship with Jesus. Like, like I want nothing more than Jesus to be my Savior and to walk with him and have a relationship with him. So because I'm doing that, he says the kingdom is for you. So when we're walking with Jesus and we, and we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we're in the kingdom, so Jesus laid out the first four. This is kind of like a, a lot of people call this the second Ten Commandments in the Bible. Because the first Ten Commandments, the first five dealt with God, and the second five dealt with others. And Jesus' Beatitudes, he basically takes on those same principles. And the first four deal with relationship with God. The second four deal with relationship with others. So Jesus isn't presenting new information here. He's kind of building on principles they would have known. These are things that we should instinctively know. Jesus felt this was so important that he calls his disciple and he comes close. And I believe this morning <clears throat> that he's calling you to come close and listen. 
I said, third week in a row, sorry, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> you know, what's incredible about this is Jesus calls his disciples close, and he says, you know, Jesus calls 12 guys to be his disciples. Now, I don't know about you, but anytime you get more than a couple people together, you're bound to eventually have an argument, right? A disagreement about something like that. Like, if we, if we all right now in this room, if I told all you guys that we're all going out for lunch together today, I guarantee that even though I might suggest a restaurant, five of you are going to be like, but what about this place? Yeah. And before we're done, we're going to go round and round and round because we want what we want, and that's our way. Jesus caught 12 disciples, and they each had different backgrounds. Andrew, Peter, James, and John were fishermen. They were blue-collar fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector, Simon a zealot. We don't know what the other six did, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, James, Thaddeus, and Judas Iscariot. We don't know what they did for profession, but what's con- what we do know is each of them had their own personality. They had their own character. And, and get this, Matthew would have been considered a traitor to his people. Matthew was a tax collector who went to work for the Romans. So all these Jewish guys, they were hating on Matthew from square one. Like, it made no sense why Jesus would add a tax collector into the mix. So you have to believe that they've had their, they would have had their moments of squabble and not getting along. It's one thing I like about watching The Chosen. The Chosen kind of shows that in the characters. How they all start hating on Matthew until they get to know him. And Have you ever been that kind of person where it feels like everybody's hating on you? What do you do about it? So Jesus lays out, this is what relationships look like in the kingdom. So Jesus knew that even, I believe the reason why he called his disciples close, because he's like, if you 12 guys are going to follow me, you're going to have to get this right, because otherwise we're going to have some problems. Because imagine traveling day in and day out, town and village and town and village and city after city, with 12 guys that are bickering the whole time. I mean, I know it's like sometimes I get in the worship team in the morning, the siblings start bickering, and I'm like, would you guys just knock it off already? (laughs) It's natural. So Jesus looks at his disciples and says this. He says, here's how we relate in the kingdom, Matthew 5, 7. He said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful. To be merciful is to show forgiveness and compassion. It's to those in need. Jesus frequently spoke of this trait when he said, even in the prayer, he said, Father, forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. Jesus instructs the Pharisees, you know, go and learn what I meant, that I desire the mercy and not sacrifice. You know, God is merciful because God is so merciful that we, we deserve punishment for our sin. We, we deserve what Jesus got on the cross. He, yet God in his great richness and his mercy is so merciful that he looks at you and just says, man, if you would just repent and accept my son, God wipes your debt clean. Can I get an amen on that this morning? Are you happy about that? God's mercy is so incredible. Jesus says, man, I've not come to call the righteous but sinners, and he has mercy on them. I think of a story of the woman caught in adultery where this, this woman's caught in adultery, and the Bible says, and, and she's so guilty, she's, she's, they're ready to stone her, young men and people and these kids, and they're picking up stones, and, and they're ready to stone this poor lady, and they ask Jesus what he thinks, and, and Jesus bends down, and he writes something in the sand, and the Bible says what he wrote in the sand at all, but whatever he wrote, they dropped their stones and walked away. He without sin cast the first stone. Jesus had mercy on a lady who deserved to be stoned, but decided he decided to show her mercy. It is incredible for us to think about how merciful God is, and yet God said, blessed are those who are merciful, which is me and you, which means, okay, I know that if you live long enough, there are some people in your life that just get on your nerves. Can I get an amen? If you've been married long enough, right? Right? Your spouse sometimes gets on your nerves. You know, there's, there's people, and you know, guess what? We're in church. There's church people who you're not going to like sometimes. Oh, I can't believe I said that in church. It feels, it's true. There's even people in church. It's just people, whether it's in your work, your job, your spouse or somebody. At times, there's somebody that just takes you off. There's somebody that you get mad about. Politicians, right? Amen. I mean, and yet we're supposed to be merciful. Which merciful means, if I'm not merciful, which means I'm looking for ways to pay them back. You make me mad, I'm going to show you. Anybody ever do and act like that? You make me mad, I'm going to show you. I'm going to let you know. You say something cross to me, I'm going to say something cross to you. You know, whatever it is, and you get upset, and you don't have no mercy. Right? Anybody watch Karate Kid as a kid? What did Cobra Kai say? No mercy. 
right? Just demolish your opponent and get rid of them. And that's the world we live in, a world that has no mercy whatsoever. You look on social media. How many people on social media have no mercy because the minute somebody says something cross-eyed, 20 people attack them. And the situation might not have nothing to do with you, but you know what? You got your keyboard in your hand. You're not feeling very merciful. So you're going to let somebody who you probably don't even know who, how you feel about what they're going through. Where if we were merciful, we'd just turn our phone off and ignore it. If I'm merciful in my relationship, which means, man, I've been married for a long time. Lord, pray for me this morning. <laughs> it's, I've been married a long time. There's times Rami and I don't get along. That's just the way couples work, the way God created us, you know, and there's, there's a right way and a wrong way to fight and so on. If we didn't have mercy in our relationship, we'd fight all the time. You didn't do the dishes, you didn't put the seat down. You didn't do the laundry, you didn't take out the trash. You spent too much money on coffee this week. You went off for lunch with your friend. I mean, you, you <laughs> I'm telling you, I balance, I balance the check and the cut. I look, and there's KDMC cafeteria, KDMC cafeteria, KDMC cafeteria. It's always a couple of dollars. I'm like, she's drinking coffee. I'm like, I gave you a curry rig for your office, and you have K cups. Why are you buying coffee? Right? It don't make no sense to me. So when I'm not feeling merciful, I go, hey, wait a minute. You spent 21 bucks this week on coffee. Why? When you got K-cups and a cure in your office. I don't understand this. What is going on here? I know he went to Sam's and you bought the big box of McDonald's cups. You should be good for months. What is going on here? Well, honey, you know, the, the cafeteria just makes some really good coffee. <laughs> now, if I wasn't merciful, I'd be like, well, they bring the K-cups home and you can't do that no more. You, know, you have a reason to fight. Instead, I'm like, you work 40 hours a week, go have your coffee. When you're merciful, you can overlook things, and that's great. And that's what God does for us. He overlooks things that we so desperately need. This week, we were out evangelizing. We got a, our team was out. We were standing out here by Save a Lot, and we were out there for over an hour. And we're just giving out invites, talking to people. But while we were out there, me and Alan and, and so on, Andrew, Katie, Rami, we're out there, and we're just talking to people, and we're like, do you know Jesus? And I'd say nine out of ten people told us they knew Jesus. They, they could tell us when they had a relationship with him and when they met him. The next question is, were you going to church anywhere? Nine out of ten people said they weren't going to church anywhere. And every one of them let us pray for them, for the struggles they were going through. I mean, we were holding church in that parking lot, amen? We were praying over people that were crying and going through some stuff. And I'm like, I'm trying to tell them it's a lot easier to follow Jesus when you're in church. But I have to realize that, man, sometimes church isn't very merciful. And there's a lot of people dealing with church hurt. They've been judged. They've been in bad situations. Some pastor let them down. Some board let them down. Whatever it is, that there was no mercy. We need to be a merciful kind of people that when we see people that are hurting, they're, they're outside of church because their church hurt, that we show them the kind of mercy to say, man, we love you and Jesus loves you. Let us show you the way. Amen. When you're merciful, you're, you're drama less. When you're merciful, you, you choose what to fight for. Mercy doesn't mean you roll over and get walked all over. It just means you choose when to fight. You pick your battles. Anybody raising kids in here know that there's times you've got to pick your battles. And if you're not picking your battles, you find yourself yelling at the kids all the time. But if you pick your battles, you can win some victories. So be merciful like our Lord is merciful. That's all he's really asking us. A, a merciful person is somebody who's poor in spirit. And somebody says, I'm a sinner and you're a sinner, so who am I to judge you? I'm going to have mercy. Uh, a, mer a merciful person is somebody who's meek. There's some humility in their life. I don't have to puff up my chest. And then a merciful person is somebody who hungers and thirsts for right relationship with God, so to speak, but right relationship with others. If I'm merciful, I care more about a relationship with Jennifer than I care about judging Jennifer. You know, that's just what mercy is. I look at the people in my community and I care more about having a relationship with them than I care to look at what's wrong with them. That's the kind of church you want to be merciful. The next one is pure in heart. Matthew 5, 8, he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Anybody want to see God? Man, I long for that day to see that. I, long, man, I want to see what Moses saw. I want to see, John, I want to see what they, I want to see it. I'm hoping to come out of that with the Shekinah glory, glory all over me, glowing, and like, it's just be awesome. I want to see God, amen. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, and he refers to our spiritual center of our life. It is where our thoughts, desires, and sense of purpose and will and understanding and our character resides. Blessed are the pure in heart. Here's the thing. 
Blessed and pure in heart. And Jesus, what Jesus is not saying, this is not about being perfect, guys. But it's about being honest with God and others and being faithful. Knowing that it's Jesus who makes you perfect. I will never be perfect on my own because I just don't have it like that. I have a sin, a flesh issue, all that stuff, just like everybody else. It was Jesus who makes us perfect. Jesus is not calling you to be perfect this morning. He's calling you to be faithful and he makes you perfect. So when you think about being, being pure in heart, a pure in heart is when I look into my heart and you know what? This is the kind of person, if you're the kind of person this morning, you're like, I hope they don't find out. I hope they don't find out. Man, I hope they don't find that out about me. Well, I hope nobody, I hope nobody sees me doing this. I hope nobody notices what I've been up to. And you have some stuff in the background that you're hiding. This is the, this is the beatitude that's for you. Because a pure in heart means that before God, there's nothing between me and him. I have an openness in my heart. I've been broken. I've been open before God. I've confessed everything. I'm not trying to hide anything. As if I could hide. Why is it that we do this? When things are going good, right, you'll go to church, you'll read your Bible, you'll pray, you'll worship, you, you, you just, you're doing pretty good. You'll come, your home life is pretty good. But the minute something happens, we start walking away from God. We stop praying, we stop reading our Bible, we stop going to church, we start opening up to others, and we act like we're just going to hide out. Like if there's a rock on this planet that's big enough for you to hide from God. Right? And, you, and you're like that. You're like, you're like the little kid playing hide and seek. You're hiding behind that rock like, God, don't notice. Yet the Bible says there's no place we could go to hide from him. It's, you might be trying to hold on to some things in your heart that God wants you to get rid of. He knows. It's so, silly to, it's so silly to try and keep something in here that don't belong there when God knows. And you know what, too? God uses others. This is what a discipling relationship is. God uses others to challenge your heart. God uses others to build you and grow you as a Christian. Right? This is why we're doing what we're doing on Wednesday night. Ladies, would you agree that when you're sitting around the table and you're talking and encouraging each other, God uses each other, right? Just like men, we would agree to build each other up. Well, I shouldn't have the kind of relationship with God where one if I'm pure in heart, there's nothing between me and God. I've repented of my sin. I've confessed it all. I've given my heart to him. I have nothing to worry about. But the same thing when I walk in the church, I should also have the same kind of heart where, where you know me so well that you know the good, the bad, the ugly, the wrinkles, the whole nine yards. I'm just raw and honest. I'm me, you're you, and we're family. That I'm not trying to come in the door with a, oh, I hope they don't know. Well, I hope they don't figure that out this morning. If we could have the kind of relationships in the church where, where it was a safe place where you came in, you could just be open and vulnerable and just say, here I am, Here's my, this is me, this, this is what I'm struggling with. And everybody else in the church said, amen, let me pray for you, let me love you, let me encourage you. That's the way it's supposed to be. Man, we fail that sometimes so bad. Sometimes we judge people so quickly that we don't give them a chance to open up. And look around the room this morning, you should know the heart of the person around you. We should be creating, I hope that God, I believe in the beginning of these days, I'm not saying I hope, I know we're the kind of church where if you're struggling with something, you can come in and confess it, you're going to find some encouragement, some prayer, and some support, amen? That's what we want to do. So those people in our community that are lost and hurting and struggling could come in and find a safe place and experience the kingdom. So if you're the kind of person this morning, you're like, man, I hope God doesn't know, I hope Pastor Bob don't find out what I did, <laughs> Go to the altar and get rid of that this morning and leave here without that baggage, amen? Pure in heart also means that I protect my heart, which means I'm going to be careful with what I read, what I watch, what I say, what I do, what attitudes I let in, and all that kind of stuff. Like, I'm going to protect my heart because if my heart is for Jesus, I don't want to let junk get in there. So I'm not going to waste my time watching things on TV that don't make my heart feel good. I'm not going to go listen to music and things like that that don't make my heart feel good. It don't make the spirit feel good. And I'm going to watch the attitudes I get. I'm going to pick and choose my fights. I'm going to choose to be merciful because when I'm merciful, I can watch my heart. See, if I have no mercy and I'm angry all the time, it's hard to check your heart. But if you're merciful and your heart is open and you're pure in heart, you can let all that go. I know some of you in the church, you got some baggage in your heart. The Lord been trying to let you to let it go, and you're holding on to it as if it's some reason it's going to do something for you. 
let it go. If it's unforgiveness, if it's hurt, if it's anger, if it's church hurt, if you've been hurt in new beginnings, you come talk to me, I'll be the first one to apologize and figure out a way to do better. If you've been hurt out in the community and maybe in another church, another thing like that, and you're carrying some baggage in your heart this morning, let it go. God, get, God brought you here so you can have a new beginning, not so you can continue your baggage. Be pure in heart. Protect your heart. Here's another way we, we're pure in heart, too. If I'm pure in heart before God, so God, I also have to be pure in heart in my relationship. Right? I'm called to be two becoming one with my wife. We're, we're called to oneness. We're called to unity. We're called that we're one flesh, as the Bible says. So I have to make sure that in my relationship with my marriage, this is Valentine's week and I'm going there, that in my relationship with my marriage, I'm protecting my heart. Which means I will not allow myself to look at or lust after or chase after whatever that is not what God gave me. The Bible says to rejoice in the wife of my youth because that's the blessing God has for me. So I make sure that in my heart, that is the most beautiful, most incredible woman in the world. My eyes are for her. My heart is for her. And I'm protecting my heart. Which I'm not going to open up stuff on a computer or whatever, whatever it is. I ain't going there. I have to choose to protect my heart. Even though sometimes she's difficult. <laughs> Couples, protect your heart. Protect your heart before God and protect your heart before others so that you can be pure in heart. Because Jesus says, man, if you're pure in heart, if you're pure in heart, for they shall see God. See, I don't want to get before God someday and God say, man, Bob, I'd like to let you in, but we got to talk about your heart this morning. Nope, I ain't doing that. I don't want that. You shouldn't want that either. For it says, if I'm pure in heart, I'm going to see God someday, and I want to see God. Amen. So get honest with your heart this morning. Get honest with your thoughts. The only truly way for us to be pure in heart is we have to give our lives and heart to Jesus. Sometimes in the church, what I see sometimes is sometimes while you're in church, you're that good Christian. Everybody's like, hey, that's sister, brother, so-and-so. But you know in the background there's some stuff in your life that God doesn't agree with. That's, I hope they don't find out. Don't let anything get between you. The, we live in the kind of world that wants you to put a lot of things between you and God. I mean, look at our kids this week. Our kids were attacked on the Grammys. The Grammys showed a demonic display of unholy is the name of the song they show. You know, and it's like, that's who's going after our kids. That's who's going after our young ones. That's, that's the stuff that they want our kids to be listening to. Unholy songs where, they, where we praise Satan and, and, and TV stations like, hey, we're getting ready to worship. No, you're not. You're going to hell. <laughs> you're in trouble. That's the stuff that are trying to go after our kids. We have to teach our kids not only a pure heart in my marriage, but I have to teach my kids how to have a pure heart, which means I have to teach my kids, especially nowadays when we give our kids smart devices. If you're giving your kids smart devices with no restrictions, they're open to the world, you better believe the world's going to come after them and not come knocking on the door. We want to teach our kids to be pure in heart, which means when stuff pop up on their phone, they bounce and get rid of it. Imagine having a kind of relationship where your little one comes to you and say, hey, this popped up. I just want to show you. I didn't want to look at it. Can you delete that for me, mom and dad? If we don't teach our kids how to be pure in heart, man, they're going to have a hard future because the world's coming after their heart. The next one is blessed are the peacemakers. I think five, nine. Blessed are the peacemakers, so they shall be called sons of God. I like that title, sons of God, amen. God is a peacemaker. And God in his love is a peacemaker. And God sent Jesus to make peace for us. Jesus, in, Jesus is in the reconciliation business. He, he wants to reconcile us to God the Father. And he offers himself as a peace offering, as a sacrifice. And, and Jesus is saying our kingdom relationships have to be built on mercy. They have to be built on trust and openness. But they also have to be built on the idea of peace. Now, in, in, in their day and age, they would say peace shalom, or they would say peace, peace. It's like, peace, it's like they want a double peace. They wanted so much peace that that's the way they greeted each other. If you've been watching The Chosen, you see that very clearly. Every time they walk into the house or walk home, they swear they say, right? They say shalom. It's, it's just kind of the thing that they do, and they, they bid each other peace. We live in the kind of world where it's, it's hard to find peace, amen? It's hard, and you put the news on for five minutes, and it's hard to find peace. It's hard to find peace in our communities and our neighborhoods because everybody is so wound up and so riled up. It feels like sometimes at any moment the whole world could just go to war in a second. Right now we're bombing things that are flying over our country. 
Three times in the last week, they had to shoot something down under the sky that didn't belong there. It makes us wonder, like, what's coming? What are you praying about? Sometimes it's hard to find peace. And it's, you know what's really hard to find peace? If you're a drama person. A drama person is the kind of person where you're always looking for some drama. You're the kind of person that you're, you're always pushing people's buttons, and, and you enjoy doing that. Anybody know a drama person? You see them on social media all the time. They're usually the ones that went and start something, and then when it didn't go their way, they're like, I'm quit social, I'm done. And it's like, there's, there's always a drama going on. It's like, man, if you'd shut your phone off and just chill. <laughs> it's hard to see peace in, in, in the racial tension in the world we live in. We still see racism. We still see anger. We, we, still, see, we still see so much persecution. But, but peacemaking is a decision to say that if far be it as me, I'm going to live at peace with everybody, which means I'm going to choose to pick my battles. I'm going to choose to have mercy. I'm going to choose to be open. And as far as it is to me, I just want to be at peace with people, which means I want to live a peaceful life like Jesus did. Jesus didn't go walk around looking for trouble. He went walking looking to save people. Now, surely trouble found him, but you never see Jesus like, man, I'm so sick of those Pharisees. I'm getting into a word fight today. I'm so sick of those Pharisees. I'm going to beat this guy up, right? You ever see Jesus? He's ready to jump on somebody. Who, who, I mean, you just don't see that. But sometimes in the world we live in, we're like that right away. Boy, that person said something on social. I don't like I'm going to beat them up. You know, let me, let me tell them. And, and when a peacemaker or somebody is not forgiving, you can't have peace if you're unforgiving. If you're the kind of person where you're carrying baggage and you're unforgiving towards other people, you, you're going to have a hard time being a peacemaker. Because in Jesus being a peacemaker is because he was forgiving. It's because he was merciful. Because he was willing to let things go that he could have took offense to, but he decided not to. You look at somebody and say, you know what? I could be mad at you. I could have a fight with you. I'm going to be a peacemaker and said. And sometimes a peacemaker means I just need to shut you off for a while. You ever have one of those things where maybe, you're, maybe it's a family member or somebody and, and they're coming after you and you're having a hard time having peace with this person and, and you're going on social every day, you're checking your email, whatever it is, and you're waiting them for, for them to say something, so you can say something, and you, you got this back and forth kind of thing. Well, a peacemaker would be like, I'm going to shut that off and just leave it alone. I'm going to leave you alone for a couple of days because I don't want to fight with you. Even in marriage, there's been times, right? Look at Rami and said, I love you. Don't talk to me for a week. <laughs> I don't think it's ever been that long. But there is times you take a time out. You know, honey, I'm going for a ride. I've seen a couple of hours. I choose to be a peacemaker with you because I could stand here. And every marriage is like this. Every marriage has the one person who likes to fight and the other person who doesn't like to fight. Right? Most couples have that. Most couples have the one person who likes to fight, make the point, and the other person who's just kind of walking away. And it's hard to hit peace in that. I've seen so many couples over the years where they're, they're so busy tearing each other up because they had an argument about something, and maybe it's the wife. Maybe the wife is the one who likes to argue because she's one of those nagging kind of women the Bible talks about. And so she gets her husband and says, we're going to have this conversation. I'm going to tell you how I'm feeling. You just need to deal with me. And the husband, he's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's the wife. She's like, can okay, we just have a time out? No, you're going to hear me because I'm the king of my castle. It's hard to have peace if we don't let things go. And it's hard to have peace if we don't pick our battles. And it's hard to have peace if we just don't walk away at times. And sometimes you've got to walk away. But the worthy life is this. It's one where we're merciful. It's one where we're compassionate. We're as forgiving as Jesus is. We're as honest as God is. We choose peace with other people. We choose to be forgiving. We choose to let some things go. That's not being walked all over. It's not like we don't care. It's not like we don't fight at the right times. It just means I'm picking my battles to honor the glory of God. Amen. The last part Jesus says here is blessed are those who persecuted. Nobody likes that word. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. There is always going to be people who reject Jesus. There's always going to be people who reject Jesus. We live in the world where people will put on an unholy display in the Grammys because they reject Jesus. Maybe you're the kind of person where you have people in your own family and life where they reject Jesus. And it creates some tension in your family. 
Maybe you're the kind of person, I pray for this all the time for our younger people and our dating people and our teenagers and so on, because it's hard to follow Jesus when the world around you is not following Jesus. It's hard to honor. Nowadays, the world wants sex before marriage, and they want impurity and things like that. And if you're a young adult or a teenager, and you're trying to follow Jesus, and, and you're not going there, and you're not partying, and you're not doing those kind of things. Like, I pray for, for kids Zach's age, according to these kind of kids nowadays, have so much peer pressure in school. Hey, you want to smoke this or do whatever? And our kids are trying to follow Jesus, and it's really, really hard. So when they choose to follow Jesus, then all of a sudden they look weird. You know, people start picking on them. Oh, you're a Jesus follower. Oh, you're not cool. And, you know, our kids go through a lot. We don't even realize that. Or maybe it's you. Maybe you're at work. Maybe your coworkers are not following Jesus, and you're trying to follow Jesus, and they give you some stuff about it. Maybe you're the kind of person like, man, you're always at church because they don't go to church. Maybe you're in a relationship this morning where the person you're with, they're not following Jesus, and you're trying to follow Jesus, and it creates some tension. You know, that's, that's persecution, it's not the same as what people are going through in other parts of the world where they're under the ground. Church is hiding from, hiding from governments that want to kill Christianity or hiding from Muslims or other things that want to get rid of Christians. You know, we face, we face this in our, in our culture right now where traditional marriage is attacked. Our worldview as Christians is counterculture. So because we have a counterculture of you and our worldview is attacked, we're going to face persecution. So if you're following Jesus, there's a kind of time in your life where somebody's going to be against you. And Jesus says, guess what? Blessed are you when that happens. Jesus said we should count that as glory because Jesus was persecuted and the prophets were persecuted. So guess what? It's going to happen. So, so when somebody comes against you and they're just giving you some stuff because you follow Jesus, you should be like, I raise a hallelujah. Amen. Don't be surprised by it. He said, man, don't be surprised when they persecute you. And don't be surprised that people utter all kinds of evil against you falsely in my name. You know, don't we see that nowadays? There's a lot of trash that gets talked about Christianity. There's a lot of trash. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of making fun of our faith. And especially when it comes down to standing up for traditional marriage or, or standing up for life or any of the issues that we should care about. You got people who just mock Christianity. You already watched The View? You watch some of those TV shows where those ladies, they have no problem mocking Christianity. They pick on it all the time. You know, it's no surprise for us that the world's getting crazier. And, and so we might have a day in our lives where we see that when we're standing up for righteousness, we might see some persecution. Don't let that surprise you because as the days wear down and Jesus becomes, gets closer to his return, it's going to get crazy, y'all. It's biblical. So don't be surprised. If you're in one of those situations right now where somebody's giving you some stuff for following Jesus, you should rejoice. Amen, God. I must be doing something right. Because if the devil ain't messing with you, you're probably walking with the devil. Right? You ever hear that saying before? If the devil ain't messing with you, you're probably doing something he likes. But if you're being faithful to Jesus, you're going to get messed with. That's the way it goes. He goes on to say this. He said, rejoice and be glad. <laughs> That's kind of funny, is it? Lord, you don't understand. They called me a Jesus freak. Be glad. If you're single this morning and, you, and you're trying to honor God and save it for marriage and, and somebody's giving you a hard time about it, rejoice and be glad. Say, man, that's right. I'm, I'm holding out for Jesus. If, you, if you're a kid in school and somebody's trying to pressure you to do something that you know you shouldn't be doing, rejoice and be glad and stand for Jesus. And here's the thing. When you're standing for Jesus, guess who stands with you? Jesus. God, that awesome God we sing about this morning, when you stand for him, he stands with you. And you know what I learned in history? Anybody like history? Christianity is over 2,000 years old, and there's been a lot of persecutors and a lot of haters, and they're all dead and buried in the ground, and we're still worshiping in church this morning. Stand for Jesus, amen. So as we wrap up the Beatitudes, and we move a little further into chapter 5 this next week, you got to remember that God wants nothing more than for you to praise him this morning with, with a spirit of truth and honesty. To open yourself up and, and to mourn your sin and, and to be meek and be humble and gentle and be open and, and hunger and thirst for righteousness. But then he wants you to think about how is it, God, that I'm treating people? 
See, this is all about loving God and loving others. And this is how, this is how you love God, is, is, is you're honest with him, you're open, you're humble for him, you, you hunger and thirst for him. But how are you loving others? Is you're merciful with people. You're forgiving with people. You're patient, you're peaceful with people. You're, you're a person of reconciliation. You're trying to take back what hell has stolen, and you're trying to get right with people. That's how you love people, is be a peacemaker. Stop the drama. Be merciful. Be forgiving. Choose your battles. You know how you love people? Is you choose to love them the way Jesus did, which, guess what? There's people who are going to persecute you. They're going to wrong you. They wronged Jesus, and when he was on the cross, he looked down and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Guess what? You probably have somebody in your life who's giving you some stuff. It's because they don't know what they're doing. And you can either fight them or pray for them. You can either fight them or you can hand them over to the Father and say, God, I'm going to do with David. If you've been reading with our Bible plan, we've been in 15, 16, and 17 lately. How many times has David handed over to God? God, I give you my enemies. God, I make my enemies a footstool. God, I just give it to you. He just goes against says, I just give you this problem, God, because you're God, and you can take care of it. Amen? Jesus looks at his disciples, and just basically, if we sum up the Beatitudes, it's like, can you be like Christ this morning? Can you choose to just be like Christ? Be like Christ in your relationship with God and your relationship with others. Amen? Let's pray. Worship team, head back up. I have to give them a name this morning. It's like, like Bob and the Sigets. <laughs> God, we pray this morning. God, we're so grateful for just your word here, Jesus, to tell us that this is a, a righteous way of living a righteous way of living, God, that you've given us the instructions on how to live with other people, that there's, there's times where relationships are difficult, they're challenging, they're hard. Sometimes we're not sure what to do with the people around us that are just difficult, but Lord, you tell us, men, to be peacemakers. Lord, I pray for us in the church that we would choose to be peacemakers. Lord, I pray that we would choose to be merciful, that we would choose to pick our fights and battles, and that we would be a people who, like you, let it go more than we fight about it. Lord, help us to see the world around us the way you did on the cross, to realize that the people that are making a mess is because they don't know what they're doing. So God, help us to have compassion and mercy. And God, I pray for those this morning. I pray for especially our kids and our teenagers and, and maybe even some adults in this room that they're trying to follow Jesus, but it's difficult, Lord, because there's people around them that are picking on them or giving them a hard time or they're trying to, they're trying to, to get them to do things they shouldn't do, like, like to do drugs or to have sex or, or whatever it is that they're just trying to push our kids to. Or, or God, I pray, I right now I pray against culture, God, in the name of Jesus, that all this unholy stuff and this demonic stuff and everything that's keep trying to attack our kids and persecute them. God, I pray that our kids would rise up in the name of Jesus, that they would stand strong, that our teenagers would choose a relationship with you, that they would choose the hunger and thirst for righteousness and, and just say no to that kind of stuff and, and to see what it is, see it for what it is. It's, it's just worthless. Lord, I pray for couples this morning that they choose to be merciful with each other to be for peacemakers in their household with each other, that, that they choose to live as kingdom citizens and, and they could fight about something, but maybe it's not worth fighting about anymore. Maybe it's time to reconcile. Lord, we pray for a healing of relationships. Lord, we pray that we, your people, will learn to operate the way you do, Jesus, that we'd be merciful, we'd be peaceful, we would, we would see persecution and be glad that it's coming. Lord, help us to take back what hell has stolen in our community and be the kind of people, Lord, that if somebody's dealing with church hurt, they've been chased out of church, the church has messed up and has failed them, Lord, that we can be the kind of place that's reconciled for them, to show them the way that they can be loved, they can be cherished. God, help us to be merciful and to be peaceful and to choose to love people more than anything else. Lord, I pray for new beginnings, that we would be the kind of church that we welcome all people. And when people come in here, no matter what baggage is on their heart, they can have their release of letting it go and letting them know that here there's freedom. There's freedom because you're here, Jesus. And Lord, I pray this week for those people that we met on the street the other night that we were so hoping would be here this morning. God, I pray that our words planted a seed, God, that one day would bring a harvest, Lord. God, it feels like we're working the harvest so hard. God, we're waiting for the day to see the fruit. And Lord, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. Lord, I know you're going to bring it. Lord, and we just help us, God, to be faithful, to be like you, Jesus. 
Lord, we thank you that your beatitude shows us who we are becoming in you. That we're not perfect, but you make us perfect. Lord, thank you for loving us so much that you're merciful, you're graceful, you're forgiving. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be exactly the same. Lord, help us to be the people that you said are blessed so that one day we could see the kingdom and it's full and it's full picture of it. Someday we'll stand before God and we'll be, the, we'll be called sons of God, daughters of God. Jesus, help us to walk so faithful with you that nothing gets in the way so that one day we'll hear you call us blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.